to be humble, to be kind. It is a giving of the peace in your mind to a stranger, to a friend. To give in such a way that has no end. We are love. We are one. We are how we treat each other.
Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley. I'm Reverend Marcus Liefert and it is so good to be with you on this gray but still beautiful Sunday morning. We are thinking of our choir this morning who are over singing with our sister congregation, the UU Society of San Francisco and our music director, Brian Baker, with them. So we are glad to be connected with them in this way. If you're visiting with us this morning, if you're new to our community, I want to offer you a special welcome. We hope that no matter who you are or how you make your living, no matter how you experience the sacred or whom you love, you will feel welcome among us here. If you have questions, want to know more about what's happening in the life of our community, the folks at the welcome table in the atrium are always happy to talk. And if you go all the way across the atrium into the social hall after the service, everyone's invited to linger for lunch. We have a wonderful kitchen team making a lunch for everyone every week. And uh, anyone's welcome to join that kitchen team, by the way. And then there's also coffee in there. So please stick around for coffee and conversation if you can. We're launching into our last sermon series, worship series of the year, of the church year. Now until June, we'll be talking about living under the rainbow sign, how we understand beauty as an organizing, a moral organizing principle. So we'll just be scratching the surface of that today, and, and we'll be lingering with it through May and into June. If there's anything on your heart this morning, a joy or a sorrow, grief or gratitude that you'd like lifted up, read aloud during the service, you're always welcome to write it on the memory book, on the table in the back of the sanctuary. There's also candles there that you can light for a silent memory or prayer. Once more, welcome. Let's rise in body or in spirit and sing together. We're going to sing Dear Weaver of Our Life's Design. It's 22 if you want the words, the music. Jason, and I'll be your worship associate today, standing in for Don Close, who is not feeling so well. So as we light our chows to begin our services, we remind ourselves that our church occupies land in Huchion, the unceded territory of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people. May we have the humility and courage to do our part to restore what has been broken and the wisdom to live into a new solidarity with indigenous communities and the earth. Let us rekindle our chalice flame with these words by Suzelle Lynch. Our community is filled with beauty. When you open the door to greet me, that's where the beauty begins. When you share with me what's important to you, beauty is there as I listen. When we join hands, 
to practice compassion, beauty's heart blooms like a flower. When we teach or learn or work for justice, beauty abounding sparks joy in all. Let's light the chalice for beauty now, the beauty we seek, the beauty we share, and the beauty we nurture together. Would you now join me in saying our covenant? Love guides this church. The quest for truth and justice is its common purpose. To give thanks, listen deeply, speak with care, honor our differences, and seek and grant forgiveness. These things we covenant with one another. I've got a story to share this morning, and I wonder if anyone wants to come up here. I've got some, some uh, rudimentary illustrations to share as part of the story. Anyone's welcome to come on close, young or young at heart, or, or old at heart. You can come on down, whatever. Uh, this, is, this is a story by, by Peter Reynolds, adapted from Peter Reynolds. It's called The Dot. And it's about a little girl named Vashti. And uh, we'll, we'll see, there's a lot of pictures that I'm going to try and get going, and they'll sync up or not with the story, but we'll, we'll do our best. So let's, let's start it here. So we've got uh, Vashti here, who was at art class, and Vashti did not like art class. Do any of you not like art class? Good. You're not, that's, okay, few. None of the, no, but do any of you not like art class? At least a few, right? I didn't, I didn't like art class. Vashti, she didn't make any marks on her paper. And eventually her uh, teacher, she came to, to look, and, and she take, took a look at this, this blank piece of paper in front of Vashti, and she said, hmm, a polar bear in a snowstorm. Very creative. And Vashti said, hmm. I don't like art class. And her teacher said, well, you just need to make a mark and see where it takes you. So Vashti got her pen and jabbed it down as hard as she could and made a dot. And her teacher took that dot and looked at it, gave it a good, nice, long look and said, hmm, now sign it. And Vashti was very puzzled by this, and she, she signed her name, and, and then her teacher took it back. And the next week at class, 
Vashti was surprised to see her art was hanging on the wall, framed in a golden picture frame. And she thought, well, I can make a better dot than that. <laughs> so she made a, another dot, and, and then she started making more dots. She realized she could, she could make not just one dot, she could make a whole bunch of dots. She, she started playing with dots of all different colors, and once she made it a whole bunch of little dots, she realized, well, I could actually, I could make a really big dot. And she made a, a really enormous dot. And, and then she, she realized if she could make a big dot, she could make a big dot with a little dot inside of it. And she started playing with sizes of dots and dots inside of dots. She kept playing with her dots until she even made a dot without making a dot. She made a dot by not making a dot. She made so many dots that her teacher said, and we might have to get through a few of them here, her teacher said, it's time for an art show. And so everyone came, well, there's that dot without making a dot, and she, everyone came to walk around a gallery of Vashti's dots. And it was just amazing to see all these dots. And one little boy came up to her at the gallery. And he said, you are such a good artist. I could never do that. I can't even draw a straight line. And Vatsky said, oh yeah? Show me. And so he drew this not straight, kind of a wiggly line. Vashti got a good look at it, and she said, now sign it. Will you join me in singing our children to their RE class this morning? We're going to sing, come sing a song with me. Oh, oh no, yeah, we're not going to sing what's on the screen. Follow, come sing a song with me. Judy Sam. I've been a member here for quite a while. I loved this place from the start. I love it now. And because of that, Reverend Marcus asked me to talk today about making art with friends and within this, these walls and this community. Uh, I didn't love art class because I wasn't very good at it. I, I remain not very good at it, but everyone in my family, the women, are artists and were trained in art. And I've always admired them. My kind of art, and it is everywhere with us, my kind of art is in the flowers, the wildlife, the animals, the children, those things that I see making beauty all the time. But here, even though I'm not accustomed to art and I'm not that creative with it, if I'm among friends and we are asked to do a project or I'm helping, which is one of the best ways I make art here, then 
the ideas just seem to flow, and I am guided by their knowledge, and I'm guided by their trust in me, and we have a set of steps that we go through. The first one is get an idea. You're supposed to make something for some upcoming, some upcoming event. And the previous event that we've all been involved with has been stewardship. So I was helping at the stewardship group. And uh, first the ideas are talked about and decided on. I came in after that, luckily for me. But the idea was to make a sun, a big sun, and have it rise as more of us pledged to help the church. That's a great idea, and it's a great vision, and it's right behind us as we finished it, but that took a lot of steps. Even the helpers had a lot of steps. You have to have that idea. You have to talk about it, figure out how you're going to show it, Discuss, discuss, discuss a lot. When everyone's agreed and you know you can actually do it, then the work starts to put it together. And there's a little research for that. Luckily, I could help with that. And there are the things you have to decide about. How are we making it? How big can we make it? Well, we were lucky to be gifted with this gorgeous fabric, this sun shiny fabric, fabric by a member of the church. Another member of the church had a huge cylinder that was metal that we could stretch the fabric across. And then how do you do the rays in a great big sun like that? So we ended up cutting cardboard and finding paper, party paper, fancy paper, wrapping paper, and wrapping those rays around it. And how are you going to make sure they're attached and that they don't fall off? Because it's going to be up there for a while. So someone with a small sewing machine brought it here to church, and she made little buttonholes so that it could be tightly wrapped around. So everybody contributed their part, but the whole thing was the, the birth of a vision of a lot of us. And, and I think that is one of the things we talk about here and we try to do more of, and that is being good neighbors, people who can help inspire other people by their love of things and art and people, and a way that we can make big ideas work to help others out in the community. I think that's one way we're heading in the future, and we are hearing about it a lot, and we are doing it a lot. So I have written, when I started this, about the fact that art is all around us, it's within us, and we can even see parts of the galaxy through the James Webb Telescope. We can see cave art in the Lascaux um, caves in France, in the Lascaux Valley, which I actually was gifted to be able to see with my uh, mentor, Dr. Nye. And we can see down into the Marianas Trench and even see the tiny, tiny creatures that are living there. We have so many tools to use. We have so much love and ability within us. I hope that we all keep staying together, working together, seeing the beauty in everybody and the art that comes from everybody when we make a plan together. Thanks. Let's rise and body your spirit together and sing 77, Lo Seek Not Afar for Beauty. Seek not afar for beauty. 
I invite you to take a moment to settle more deeply into your seat, to feel your connection down to this good earth, this sacred earth, this beautiful earth, to take a deeper breath. A prayer of blessing followed by a shared stillness, a shared quietude. Blessed are the makers. O you who are makers, makers of beauty, of paintings and pottery and sculpture, blessed is the making. You who make with hands and hearts and minds, who make out of breath and bones and blood human lives, blessed are the makers. Blessed are those who make us laugh, who make jokes and faces and toys. Blessed are those who make messes, who make trouble and friends and when needed, make up. Blessed are those who make do, who make it last, who make it work, who make beds and make time for others. Blessed are those who make love, who make out and make more and make mistakes. Blessed are those who make coffee and tea, who make meals to share, who make conversation, who make meaning in the face of tragedy, who make merriment and awaken joy. Blessed are those who make peace, for they shall inherit the earth. Each week in this community of care and witness, we make this space to hold one another, to hold those joys and sorrows among us. Today we lift up with Kathleen, my friend George Sambaro, who's having surgery today at a clinic in Bameko, Mali. He would appreciate your prayers. They give him courage. From an email yesterday, he asked, continue to pray for me. With George, and with the many names yet unspoken, all that remains to tender yet for words in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, may we each know that what we bring here is held 
in the loving embrace of this community and by a deeper love. A love that goes by many names and is beyond all naming. That cannot, that will not let us go. May it be so, and amen. Have you ever been criticized for something that you made? Yeah, let's we'll see a show of hands. Thanks, Wynn. Uh, yes, that's uh, okay. At least most, most of us. Okay, keep them up for a second. If you, if you were criticized for something you made before the age of 10. Yeah, you can look around. That was most of us again. I'm sorry. So the whole thing's an art project, and I'm not talking about art, or not just art with a capital A. I told Judy I need someone to talk about art, not, not highfalutin art. That broad category of art that includes everything from Monet to the splatters of paint and primary colors that my son would bring home daily from preschool. The kind of art that just begs to be freed from the confines of our thoughts and skin. The kind of art that's fed by precious moments of daydream, that sometimes requires long days with no plans, and even a certain amount of boredom to come into maturity. And as it's pulled from us into the world in colors, in rhythm, in jokes, in kitchen experiments, in brush strokes and love notes, it usually has no great goals or ambitions. There's a, a moral philosopher, uh, ethicist, Dwayne Cady, who 
His book is Moral Vision, How Everyday Life Shapes Ethical Thinking. And, and he argues, like many contemporary philosophers, that there's actually a very limited role to what we classically think of as reason in how we orient our decision-making, our ethical decision-making, and our lives. He says, formal reasoning happens within conceptual frameworks, but it cannot prove or provide those frameworks. So these conceptual frameworks that lie at a deeper layer in us than our intellectual reasoning. Metaphor, he writes, allegory, parable, narrative, and life experience. All these things we might think of as, as sacred text in our tradition. Metaphor, allegory, parable, narrative, and life experience, they all reveal constructive visions that frame and guide moral reasoning. And so for an example, he says you could take, distill these down into these big overarching metaphors for life. People sometimes will think of life as a test. You can, I imagine all of us, imagine theologies that conceive of our entire lives as a test that will be judged at some end point in time. Or he offers life as a journey. That we're on some journey. This is a, a common one for us you use, we, you know, life is a journey. We're, it's, not, it's, not, it's about the journey, not about the destination. I, 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 this was a, a primary framework for me for a long time, and then I got sick of it. <laughs> I didn't want to be on a journey anymore. I didn't, I didn't want the implication of a destination or, or the forced march. Have you, ever, have you ever put yourself in a forced march, getting through all that needs to get done day in and day out? I used to sign all my newsletters with you on the journey, Reverend Marcus. That's so sweet. And then I, I got sick of it. With you on the schmerny, I started writing. So what, I, I went digging when this, when this happened to me, this crisis of faith in my life as a journey, underarching metaphor. I got curious about what I would replace it with, and, and what I landed on was this, idea that the whole thing's an art project. What are we going to make with the materials we've been given? How will we relate to our collaborators, chosen or otherwise? How will we make art in the face of war? How will we make art from the traumas we've inherited or experienced? How will we make art as the climate changes and life on our planet is endangered? I have no idea, but I, I thought I'd jot down some of my, my aesthetic principles as a sort of a credo statement. Here it is. I believe in whimsy and wandering. I believe in bearing witness, practicing inaction on the impulse to relieve my discomfort. I believe in layers, in refraction, in the microcosmic reflected in the macrocosmic. I believe in rainbows. I believe in seeing from many angles, the more vantage points, the better. I believe in trusting joy, trusting the yes. I believe in loving the ebb and the flow, the expansion and the contraction. I believe in cherishing brokenness and always seeking an underlying wholeness. I believe surprise is important. I believe messes, wildness, a little crazy is good for you. Sometimes a lot of crazy is necessary. 
I believe in order in titrated doses when it really feels right. I believe feelings are always there to help. At least they're trying to. I believe what is true at the depths of anything is true at the depths of everything. And I believe in leaving it unfinished. People sometimes talk about that state of consciousness they enter while making art. You know what I'm talking about? This flow state, or I think it's some, similar to what athletes talk about, being in the zone. Otto Scharmer, the MIT thinker, philosopher, who talks about uh, uh, presence and names his work Theory U, I think he's getting at this state when he articulates three voices that, that are barriers to living in it. The three voices that, for me, are barriers to making art with the materials of life. The first one, he says, the voice of judgment, which keeps us in black and white thinking. It's all about reducing complexity. Makes day-to-day -day life easier to manage. We need this voice of judgment to discern, to make choices easily. But when it's overactive, it negates the open mind, he says. So to have open mind, we have to let go, release, relax, the voice of judgment. And then he says the second is the voice of cynicism, which is there to protect us, I think, from emotional investment in ideas that could damage our, our egos, that are threatening. This voice of cynicism where I step back and say, you, or it can't be possible, things can't really change. This self-protected stance that I have to release in order to live with an open heart. And then he says the voice of fear. This voice of fear that urges us to pursue the safety of the status quo to keep things stable and normal. This voice of fear that negates what he calls the open will. So we release the voice of cynicism, of judgment, and of fear. We can open our mind, our heart, and our will. And it's that state of open mind, heart, and will that allows us to take anything as an opportunity for art, I believe. And I believe that if we, if we have that state, that open state, that alignment, that seeing with an artist's eye the situation in front of us, which is never ideal. I had one teacher I remember talking about, there's no ideal situation. When we look at the situation we're given with the open mind, heart, and will, then we naturally begin to align with whatever the principles are that underlie everything. And when I think about the principles that underlie everything, I can't help but thinking about God, and I know that that drives some of you crazy. So, you know, just translate me. But I was thinking about uh, Reverend Jay Atkinson, one of our members, who who's, his, gave a sermon. It was my first Sunday coming checking out church back in August. And he was talking about beauty as a the fundamental nature of God through the orientation of process theology. Beauty, God as this lure towards the beautiful. And I, I remember reading a, a, a staunch humanist Unitarian minister who was wrestling with why did Whitehead, who was this uh, thinker who started the field of process theology, why did he need God at all? It was such a rational theory, this systematic idea of how the universe was ordered in Whitehead's. He was a mathematician. Why did he need God at all? And the conclusion this reader made of Whitehead was he needed it to explain novelty. Whatever it is, whether you call it God or something else, there's got to be something that lives in the foundation of being that brings newness into existence. 
The prophet Isaiah said, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Something about this attention to newness, to what is being creatively called forth from us. Alice Walker said it like this. I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. People think pleasing God is all God cares about, but any fool living in the world can see it always trying to please us back. John, my drama teacher in high school, he had another name for this source because high school improv class uh, wasn't really one of those places where you talk creatively about what God means. He talked about when we were really kind of going in that flow, in that state, thoroughly warmed up and fully present in the improvisation games that we would sometimes astonish ourselves. Have you ever astonished yourself with what comes out of your mouth? Those moments when we'd astonish ourselves with the scenes we created and, and we would turn to him and demand an explanation. You, you set this all up. What, ha- what just happened? Oh, I think the delight John got out of those moments. This knowing grin spread across his face as he solemnly concluded the 13th dimension. That's where that came from. And whether you call it God or the 13th dimension, there is this place, this origin of newness that exists in the nature of reality. I was talking with John about this, uh, this event we're going to have next week, this installation. So he was curious about what, why it's an installation. And so I had to explain to him that I'm, I'm, not, I'm hoping not to be installed like a piece of software <laughs> or a new plumbing fixture. My hope is that it will be more like an art installation. My goal with you is to do ministry as if I were your artist in residence, alongside a community of artists. In this ministry with you, my intention is to center my work in being a wonderer, not a solver, a sharer of dilemmas, not the Savior who always knows how to resolve them. And I do think that church is about this grand art project we're all involved in, this art project that is the gap between the world as it is and the world as we know it could be and should be. It's the same gap between the vision of an artistic endeavor and the execution which inevitably falls short. To live in that gap is to be human, to be alive. To live in that gap is to make art. Elaine Scarry writes about this. She's a Harvard professor and um, aesthetic theorist, and she reminds us in her piece, Beauty and the Pact of Aliveness. She says that the word fair, as in fair play and fair practices, it comes etymologically from the aesthetic word fairness, meaning lovely incontinence or perfection of fit. So it's fair as in beautiful, fair play and fair practices. Both beauty and justice in her vocabulary have injury as their opposite term. And she says in the case of justice, this is literally the case, the second syllable of injury is the same root as injustice, and injury, she says, is the most accurate opposite to beauty. Injury as the opposite to beauty. Leaving ministry off for for, for the first ministry of my career, it was a time of, of a lot of tumult and change, and the night before we set off on our road trip to travel across the country to New York, I took a walk with the the former ministers of this congregation, my mentors with Bill and Barbara, Hamilton Hallway. And the piece of advice 
they gave in that tumultuous moment was to take time every day to notice something beautiful. And for years afterward, the practice in our family was to end each day by asking one another, what's the most beautiful thing you saw today? And sometimes that beautiful thing, it doesn't fill with joy, but with sorrow, a poignant sorrow of connectedness to life, that pact of aliveness she talks about. Do you know Zachary's Corner? down on, on Derby and Warring in Berkeley. That was sometimes the most beautiful thing I'd seen. If for over a decade now, it's been a memorial to a little boy named Zachary who attended the school my son now attends and who was struck by a car and killed there when he was five years old. And for years now, those who loved him have maintained and grown this little corner altar always bright with art and flowers and notes. At this point, the city street sign at the top of the pole that holds the center of the altar reads Zachary's Corner. This site of pain and tragedy of unbearable suffering becomes also a site of beauty, of remembrance, a rallying point to the cause of pedestrian safety that his parents have devoted themselves to. In a place of brokenness and hurt, people have made an altar to the beauty of life. And this is how it is, to keep living in the face of tragedy, to keep inspiring joy and justice in an imperfect world. A part of us knows that even with the ugliest of materials, there is beauty in the making. Felt this last week, worshiping down at the border. There's a church that gets together in Friendship Park, right on the border. Part of the park spans into Tijuana, part on the outskirts of San Diego, and there's a church that gathers there every week to lift up migrants stuck there at the border wall. And the border wall, it's not beautiful because it is, of course, doing injury to so many who are separated from loved ones across it. But there are artists who are painting on it, who are seeing in between the slats of the wall spirit moving in the air, in the waves, all the way down it goes into the ocean, a place that even though does injury, is made beautiful each week by a community that cares. Monet, the great Impressionist, he famously suffered from cataracts near the end of his life. He struggled with the loss of vision, with the way it changed his painting. Ultimately, his right eye was operated on, and then he was disappointed with the results, so he refused an operation on the left side. And it was a source, I understand, of great sadness and distress for him, but a poet, a contemporary poet, Lisa Moeller, imagined a Monet who found a deeper wisdom in the meaning of the affliction. So this is her poem, Monet refuses the operation. Doctor, you say there are no halos around the streetlights in Paris, and what I see is an aberration caused by old age, an affliction. I tell you, it has taken me all my life to arrive at the vision of gas lamps as angels, to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line I called the horizon does not exist, and sky and water so long apart are the same state of being. Fifty-four years before I could see, Rouen Cathedral is built of parallel shafts of sun, and now you want to restore my youthful errors? Fixed notions of top and bottom, the illusion of three-dimensional space, wisteria separate from the bridge it covers? What can I say to you to convince you the Houses of Parliament dissolve night after night to become the fluid dream of the Thames? 
I will not return to a universe of objects that don't know each other, as if islands were not the lost children of one great continent. The world is flux, and light becomes what it touches, becomes water, lilies on water, above and below water, becomes lilac and mauve and yellow and white and cerulean lamps, small fists passing sunlight so quickly to one another that it would take long, streaming hair inside my brush to catch it, to paint the speed of light. Our weighted shapes, these verticals, burn to mix with air or change our bones, skin, clothes to gases. Doctor, if you could only see how heaven pulls earth into its arms and how infinitely the heart expands to claim this world. Blue vapor without end. Let us be those artists whose Small fists pass sunlight so quickly to one another. You are an artist, a creator, and let's not let your third grade art teacher or anyone else tell you otherwise. Not your third grade art teacher or your childhood choir director or anyone else tell you that you, what you create does not have a place in this world does not add to the beauty and value and novelty and wonder of the universe. Let's make art together in the kitchen and the garden, at an intersection, along borders, on hilltops, at the edge of the ocean, make altars, altars to making, Altars to beauty, renew your spirit by honoring your capacity to create. If in all the things you are already making, rejoice, delight in the gift of creation. And if you have felt more barren, like the ground and trees of winter, let this season of growth and abundance, let wildflowers and Greening leaves be your call to create once more. May it be so, and amen. We invite you now into the spiritual practice of generosity. Instead of passing the plate, you can give electronically by scanning the QR code on the back of your badge, or you can put cash or check donation into the envelope that you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you. Write your name on it and mark offering plate or pledge, and then put it into the donation box beside the fountain in the atrium as you leave the service. Each week, half of the offering plate is shared with a nonprofit good neighbor organization recommended by our wonderful Social Justice Council. Thank you so much for practicing generosity with UUCB and with our good neighbors. Offerings of any amount are accepted with gratitude. We are pleased to have a good neighbor returning to our congregation again this month.
which has been known as the Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program, or, and we have today with us Emily Seelenfrund to tell us more about their mission, which has been evolving, and their um, new mission. Emily? Hello, hi, I'm Emily Seelenfreund. Um, I'm really proud to be the director of an organization like BORP Adaptive Sports and Recreation. Uh, BORP is one of the first organizations of its kind when it was founded in 1976 by people with disabilities, and it's been a leader in the field since that time. Uh, BORP provides all kinds of sports, fitness, and recreation opportunities for people with physical disabilities and vision impairments. We offer 20 to 25 programs every week and those include activities like team sports, including wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, power soccer and goalball, uh, virtual and in-person fitness classes. Our cycling center down at Aquatic Park holds over 150 cycles, which is one of the largest collections of adaptive cycles in the world. We also have kayaking down there, and we run um, adventures and outings to accessible locations all over the Bay Area in our two wheelchair accessible buses. There are a lot of barriers that keep people with disabilities from getting outside and from getting active. Adaptive equipment is expensive and heavy. Transportation for people with disabilities is always a challenge. And one of the biggest challenges is that people with disabilities often don't know that opportunities like BORP exist. BORP's whole mission and job is to eliminate those barriers and make, accessible, and make uh, fitness and recreation accessible both financially and physically um, accessible to people in our community. Um, we also have a big event coming up on May 12th. It's our Revolution Ride. It's our 22nd ride in Sonoma County. And we're going to be riding, rolling, and strolling uh, to raise money for all of the programs that BORP does. So you can learn more about that and any of our programs at www.borp.org. And I uh, thank you so much for your support and for allowing me to join you all today. Thank you, Emily. Creativity, I thought I would play an excerpt from a song I wrote about fairies having a dance in the woods. And if you will listen, um, this is the sound of fairies when they're flying. So you might listen for that at the end of the, of the excerpt.
Lovely. Please join me in dedicating our offering. We dedicate our offering and ourselves to the mission of this congregation to create loving community, inspire spiritual growth, and encourage lives of integrity, joy, and service. Buenos dias, good morning. I'm Charis Domador, your Connections Coordinator. It's been very good being here today. Please check out our website, uucb.org, to explore all the things that are available in our congregation. On the home page, under news, you'll find a link to our weekly email newsletter, which includes a list of activities, announcements, and contact information. I have a few things to highlight today. General Assembly is happening on June 20, from June 20th to June 23rd virtually. This is the annual gathering of Unitarian Universalists where we conduct business of the association, explore the theologi theological underpinnings of our faith, and lean fully into our mission and principles. If you're a member and would like to be a delegate, you can let me know or contact Victoria Bowen directly. In support of GRIP's necessary work, that's the Greater Richmond Interfaith Pro Program, we are collecting new packaged underwear, socks, bras and camisoles, or pajamas for men, women, and children. You can place them in the collection bin in the atrium through the month of April. And now Reverend Marcus will share a few words with you as well. I'm so glad to be celebrating Undies Sundays with you this month. And then today after the service is the opportunity for, if you've been visiting, if, if today's your first time, if you want to know more about our church and what it means to be a member here, uh, we invite you to stick around in the fireside room. There will be lunch there. And uh, Reverend Jay Atkinson, who I was mentioning, is uh, also a scholar of our history. is going to share a little bit about the history of Unitarianism and Universalism. Um, get to know each other a little bit. So stick around if you can. Find out a little bit more about what it means to be a part of our community. And then there's one final special announcement this morning about something happening next week. Suzette, would you tell us what's going on? Well... Um, in case you haven't heard, the installation is going to be next week. So um, I'm, we're super excited to celebrate that. And so there's a few things I want to um, remind you of. So um, it's at 2.30 next Sunday, and we're looking forward to see all of you there. We do know that there are some people who will not be in person but will attend um, virtually. And so we will have the live stream, live stream information in uh, for those folks um, in an email this week. And um, look out for e uh, email this week um, uh, with information about that, what different things are happening that day. The, I do want to talk about, if you can go to the next slide, um, some changes for next Sunday. So next Sunday is going to be the regular 11 a.m. service, and then there's going to be the ins installation. Um, the 11 a.m. service will occur at the regularly scheduled time, then it will also be live streamed. Um, since the space will need to be prepared for the installation at 2.30, we ask that if you are attending in person next Sunday for the 11 a.m. service that you leave immediately after service so that the installation elves can transform, you know, the sanctuary, the social hall, and the atrium um, for the installation. And then uh, there's going to be minimal staffing next Sunday. Uh, so there will not be the usual um, coffee or um, lunch served, but there will be a fabulous reception with lots of special treats and eats for everyone. Um, because we are expecting a larger than usual um, amount of people, um, we ask that you carpool or offer to carpool um, to, the, um, to the event at 2.30. And we, we think like we recommend that you arrive at least 2.10 um, so that you just give yourself time for parking and just to settle in before the actual service, which starts at 2.30. Um, and if you, you know, feel like, oh gosh, like 11 a.m. service, 
installation, that's a lot in one day. Um, we do encourage you to pace yourself. So if you feel like you want to um, watch the 11 a.m. service online, um, you're free to do so. Um, but we welcome you here in person as well. Um, and yeah, at the installation. So then the last slide. Um, so we are going to be planting a tree um, next Sunday. And we would love to have as many of you write your hopes and dreams for the future um, on, on little um, biodegradable tags. And so after the service, we'll, there's an installation table out there and there's some um, many different um, uh, paper, pieces of paper. We have markers, we have pens, and so we would love it if you can just stop by and write or draw. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. Just anything that you hope and wish for the future, for UUCB, um, for the world, for yourself. So, and then um, lastly, I'd like to thank all of you who have really generously um, volunteered your time or to bring dessert. Um, next Sunday and so um, thank you in advance for your generosity and um, we do need a few more volunteers um, for a few more um, jobs like for food prep or welcoming guests so um, just um, if you can stop by and let us know and we'll sign you up thank you last time in body or in spirit and sing, it's when the spirit says do. You gotta do what the spirit says do. You gotta do what the spirit says do. out a hand or touch an elbow or reach out to that 13th dimension. Let us be connected. Let us feel ourselves here a community of artists, artists who are here to play with the materials we've been given to make of whatever life brings beauty, 
joy, and justice. May it be so, and amen. Amen.